to read something to you uh, today. And Leonard Sweet is somebody who thinks outside of the box. And he is a minister of the gospel. And he wrote this a few years back. And I grabbed a hold of it because I thought it was quite interesting. He talks about A.J. Jacobs, who is an American journalist uh, and uh, who writes books based on plunge experiences. Once he read all 32 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica to see what it would be like to be uh, the know-it-all. And this is uh, what he wrote a book about. It was entitled The Know-It-All, One Man's Humble Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World. That was published in 2004. Uh, In another plunge experience, he decided only to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and everything in life. I won't even tell you what the title was. It was a little disrespectful, but I don't think it was a bestseller. And in another plunge experience, he decided to outsource everything in his life to India, including reading bedtime stories to his kids and arguing with his wife. That project bore the title, My Outsourced Life, and was published in 2005. To understand dating, he became a single woman. I don't even know what that means. Uh, He may be the funniest nonfiction uh, writer out there. But A.J. Jacobs is now most famous for the book, The Year of Living Biblically, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible, which was published in 2007, which chronicles his experiment to live for one year according to all the moral codes expressed in the Bible, including stoning adulterers, uh, blowing a shofar at the beginning of every month, and refraining from trimming the corner of his facial hair, which he followed by not trimming his facial hair at all. And Paramount uh, Pictures picked up on that and signed him to a contract. Now, that may sound strange in all of that, but I think behind the strangeness of how he would write is the idea of the power of truly living biblically. We know that Jesus came, so all of the rituals of the Old Testament could be found in him being the once and for all sacrifice for all of us, and that Jesus is the only savior of mankind, and he even claimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we look at the Bible, we recognize that it is filled with God's ways and God's principles. And if we will live in accordance with those ways and principles, we will find our lives being blessed by God. But not only that, more importantly, that our lives can be a blessing to others. So let's look at Luke chapter 6 together, starting with the 27th verse. The Bible says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. And if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now imagine if we actually lived by that. Imagine if we were shaped by the radical nature of what Christianity is really all about. Do you know that you serve, if you have asked Jesus to be your Savior, if you live for him as your Lord, do you realize that you serve a radical Messiah? In fact, he was so radical that he radically forgave. Remember when they tried to pick up stones to stone Uh, the lady caught in adultery, um, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. There was a radical nature to his forgiveness. He radically forgives. He radically loves. In fact, we know that our God loves to the point of having sent his son to die on a cross for you and for me and to rise from the dead. So when we see this, we know that over and over again in the Bible, We see Jesus not being one who simply tells you what you want to hear, but instead Jesus is constantly stretching us in our faith. Can I hear an amen to that? There's something distinct, uh, distinctive. There's something radical about uh, Christianity. 
And I was reading a story just today, and I want to share it with you. How many of you know who Corey Ten Boom is by a show of hands? I remember back when I was a boy, I was out at the Crystal Cathedral Church, uh, Dr. Robert Schuler in California, and I saw a lady that didn't look like anybody else in the church. And she was seated on the second row, and her hair was just done in a certain way up on her head. And uh, she looked yellow-orange for color of her face. Uh, I found out later she had yellow jaundice uh, when she was there. But uh, it was Corey Ten Boom. And I knew her story because her book, The Hiding Place, was made into a movie. Has anybody seen it? Have you seen The Hiding Place? And that's well worth grabbing a hold of that book or seeing that movie. She wrote a lot of books during her lifetime. But I share about people like Dwight L. Moody, who I talked about last Sunday, and Billy Graham, and Corey Ten Boom, because they they are heroes of the faith. Elizabeth Elliot, I could name uh, different ones, and I would encourage you to read their books, because it inspires us to live outside of the norm, outside of our comfort zone, beyond mediocrity, to be proactive in our faith and intentional in our faith in every way. So Corey Ten Boom, uh, it's a fascinating story, a true story. Nazi, uh, the Nazis being uh, under Hitler at the time, uh, the Nazi Germany, and uh, Corey's family, uh, they hid, and they were hoping to be able to uh, be hidden away because they knew that the, the result of being found would be that they would be taken to the prison camp. And if they were taken to the prison camp, uh, odds are they would not live through the experience. And I know that several members of the family of Corey Ten Boom did die that way in the prison camps. This is something that that was written about in one of her books. In mid-May 1945, the Allies marched into Holland to the unspeakable joy of the Dutch people. Despite the distractions of her work, Corey was still restless, and she desperately missed her beloved uh, Betsy. That was her sister, who was also right there at the same prison camp with her. But now she remembered Betsy's words, that they must tell others what they had learned. Thus began more than three decades of travel around the world as what she would uh, be self-described as a tramp for the Lord. That's what she called herself. Uh, She told people her story of God's forgiveness of sin and of the need for people to forgive those who had harmed them. Corey herself was put to the test in 1947 while speaking at a church in Munich, uh, Germany. At the close of the service, a balding man in in a gray overcoat stepped forward to greet her. Corey froze. She knew this man well. He had been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrück, one who had mocked the women prisoners as they showered. Quote, it came back with a rush, she wrote. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. And now he was pushing his hand out to shake hers and saying, A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sin is at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner amongst thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. Quote, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he said. I was a guard there, but since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had again and again to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? 
Soldiers stood there expectantly waiting for Corey to shake his hand. She, quote, wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. Standing there before the former SS man, Corey remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And Corey thrust out her hand. And as I did, she said, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bring tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love. I had tried, and I didn't have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the radical nature of Christianity, which is that we are a part of the family of God brought in by the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way to have intimacy with God. And when we consider that, and we consider the radical nature of Christianity, we must understand the Holy Spirit is inside of us. The Holy Spirit is the divine paraclete, is the Greek word for it. And that means that he is our helper, the one called alongside to help is the literal meaning. In 2 Kings, I want to bring you to a story of a prophet and a lady who is a widow. And I want to look at it a little bit with us to see what we would gather from it today, starting in the first seven verses. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Now, I want to look at this story today because I believe that God has brought you here today because he wants to stir you in your faith. I believe that there is a now to what God is doing in your life. And it's so easy to get to the point where we believe that everything that God has done that is great is in the yesterdays. Or that we can see that it would be someday in the future. But God wants you to know that he is a God in the now, and he is moving in the now in your life. Let's give him a clap offering in this place. So in verse 1, we see that her focus, this widow, her focus was what on what she had lost, what had been unfair in life, what seems within it to be undeserved. And certainly she couldn't control things for where she was. And she's relating all of this to to the prophet. Again, I shared with you the story of Lazarus. And we have Martha and Mary and Jesus delayed for two days before he came back knowing Lazarus was sick. And he was waiting for the right timing for his purposes to be fulfilled. And in that story, we see Martha and Mary and their responses of Jesus, if you had only been here yesterday, Faith. If you in the past had done this, or we recognize that you did this, but all yesterday. 
But she also says that she believes that, yes, he will be healed, Lazarus will, in the resurrection. It's not hard to believe for tomorrow. It's not hard to believe that God can do great things then. But God was stirring her to believe in the now for what he would do. Do you believe, he said to her. Do you believe? And he was calling forth the faith that was inside of her. And my daughter, Aubrey, is a photographer. She has a great camera. I can tell you that lenses cost more than the actual camera itself. And those of you that do photography, you know what we're talking about. It shocks me. I would think the base unit would be. But she takes beautiful photos. And we have others at this church that take beautiful photos. It allows for us to have a website and other means of getting the word out of the things that we're doing. With a camera, what you focus on will develop. It's also true of our lives. Here she is relating to the prophet all the things that has gone wrong in her life. And now, honestly, she's basically waiting for her children to be taken from her and for her to die from a lack of sustenance. But the prophet has something else in mind. She has focused on what she lacks. But the prophet asks her, what is it that you have in your house? And what a powerful statement that is. In Philippians 4, 8, the Bible says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's where to put our focus. And maybe you've come here today and your focus really has been on the things that have been keeping you up at night. And your focus has been on the things that you wish would be different in your life. Maybe they emanate from the past. Maybe they, it's a fear of the future. But God in the now wants you to know that he is your healer. He is the one who is able to deliver you from anything that the enemy would try to bring against you. He is an awesome and a mighty God. Never hear it to the point where you feel like you've become numb to it. Your God is ready to deliver you and your family. There may be a member of your family everybody stops praying for. After a while, it's like, well, we just gave up. Don't give up. You be the bridge builder. You be the one that holds on. Because God is looking for one whose heart is towards him. That he might pour out powerfully on their behalf and touch other lives to them. Second Kings 4.2, Elisha finds the widow in need and focuses on what she already has. Thomas Merton says these words. Everything you need to be truly happy in life is currently in your life. Now, I hope that provokes you because I believe that Thomas Merton is correct. We keep living with the idea that if I can just have this person in my life, if I can just have this job, this promotion, this amount of money in the bank, then I'll truly be happy. But the reality is, if you have a relationship with God, you can be absolutely filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory right now. You can have peace that passes all understanding. What kind of peace is that? It goes beyond our ability to even understand that peace. And that is the radical nature of the heart of our God. And that's why I believe it is correct. So we should, and I challenge you to do this today, we should ponder our lives in the now. What has God given to you that you have now? Not what do you always want, what you always feel is lacking, not what you used to have, what you don't have now, but what is it in the now that God has given to you that you can put into effect until God blesses the lives of others. And God will bless the lives of others through your obedience. And you can be confident of that. In verse 2, what do you have in your house? Elisha is teaching a principle of the word of God. Don't focus on what you lack. Wholly apply what you have. It is reminiscent, if you think about it, of Moses. Moses has a staff in his hand. And God says to Moses, what is it that you have in your hand? Well, he has a staff. And with that staff, he would lift the staff. And boy, you'd see 
You'd see miracles take place, or he could cast it to the ground. You see supernatural things that would take place. What is it that you have in your hand? Not what do you lack. What is it that you know that God has given you in this season? Now apply that. Use it and watch God use it to a supernatural flow. And then to David, we had a team that went to Israel uh, a couple of years ago. And we had a team before that that went to Israel a couple years before that. But we went to the very place where David faced Goliath. And uh, it was uh, amazing to see it, to know that you were standing on the very site where all of this happened. And boy, I could go into the story of David and starting the day with, with cheese and wine and bread, not knowing that that would be the day that it would be of such supernatural breakthrough. And he gets there and he sees that he's being mocked by his own brothers. And, uh, and they're the mighty warriors. He looks like the, just a little shepherd boy. But God's going to shake an entire nation to this shepherd boy. And there they are quaking in their boots, even the king, as they see that the big giant Goliath comes out and sets the ground rules. And why did they ever allow that? And he sets the ground rules of you send one man towards me and I'll be here and we'll fight. And then everything will be decided by that fight. And And as those that are the brothers and those that are the soldiers are quaking in their boots, listen to that shepherd boy as he says these words with righteous indignation, who dares defy the armies of the living God? And immediately you knew the presence of God was on the scene there. And even if Saul, who had once had such a powerful anointing on his life, was trying to do things in the flesh, that's not the way this boy David was going to do it. And you see him as he picks up the stones. We picked up stones when we were there, too. I won't tell you whether we brought them out of the nation, and brought them back to the United States or not, but we picked them up. And we talked about the size of the stones and what was believed to be the size of the stone and hurled at a certain velocity and bring somebody down. And, uh, and I thought about how it was that God could have brought that giant Goliath down any way he wanted to do it. He could have sucked the air right out of his lungs, and he would have dropped to the ground. He didn't choose to do it that way. He chose to work through the shepherd boy because he had faith to believe in something beyond what he saw with his eyes. He picks up five stones, wouldn't even need all five. And we've gone into teachings and studies on that, that there were five giants in the land, not just Goliath. And that's an interesting thing. And, And if you read in the scriptures, it's true. Every one of these giants had to be brought down. But we know Goliath as, uh, as the one that we talk about the most. But he picked up those five stones. But it would be the first stone that would land and do the effective work and drop the giant. Now, why the stones? It came out of his life, his life story. And out of his life story would be everything he would need to bring that giant who dared to fight God down not only to his knees, but to where he would drop all together. And when we see that, I challenge you again. What is it that is in your life? What has God already orchestrated to be there in this hour that he's putting a divine tap on? And he's going to tap that until he's able to use it and exponentially use it to bless your life and the lives of others. So it's reminiscent of Moses. It's reminiscent of David. And we pray for blessings on our lives, but the reality is that blessing uh, is the, um, it, it comes on the heels of uh, obedience and faithfulness. And so to ask God for blessing, there's, some, there's another component to that. I don't see David just getting on his knees and asking for blessing. I see him moving upon what God has already given to him. Verse 2, the second part of the verse, a small jar is mentioned of olive oil. Uh, This is believed by scholars with the original language of how this is stated about this jar, that this jar is not one of the large jars that would be for cooking, but instead that this would be one of the small jars that would be used for anointing oil. And it's interesting that we were there in Israel uh, receiving what were gifts that were given uh, to us at times at different places that we would go. And one of the gifts Uh, that was given was a small jar uh, that would be for anointing oil. Um, That is not, uh, that is what we're talking about here. It is not the large cooking jar. And I sense a spiritual lesson that is being taught by the prophet. 
And it's a lesson of, a lesson of the stretching of one's faith. In verse 3, Elisha says, don't ask for just a few of these jars, which would be the larger jars. And here is another principle. The first being the stretching of faith that we see here to go beyond what one sees with their own eyes and beyond one's circumstance to move in the supernatural. But also, not to ask for just a few. What is he saying there? In other words, don't place limitations on the blessing that God wants to bring. For God wants to bring things as big as his heart, not as small as our thinking. Plant the level of seed that you hope to harvest, not the level of seed that you think you easily and with comfort can plant. 2 Kings 13, let's look at this for a moment uh, again in 2 Kings, starting in the 14th verse. Now, Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Um, Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Now, I'll, I'll talk about what that means to just declare that statement that seems to come out of nowhere, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. And Elisha died and was buried. Now, this is one of the strangest stories in the Bible, you know, to read this, I think we read it, don't really understand it, and move to the next chapter to check it off the list. But the reality is there's much, I think, that we can learn from this. Uh, Joash is concerned, uh, as the, being the new king of Israel, is concerned about the strength of Israel. That's why he's declaring about the chariots and the armies of Israel. To shoot east out the window, what is that? What's the significance of that? is to shoot towards Syria and to the Syrians who would be to the east. The ancient custom was to shoot an arrow or to, uh, to throw or cast a spear in the direction uh, of what would be an enemy that you're about to invade. Shooting east symbolized the impending victory for Israel uh, over Syria. The idea of striking the ground is not what one might consider with striking the ground like this. It means shooting the arrow into the ground. It should have been done to the point where the prophet would then say stop. But instead, he chose when to stop prior to the prophet speaking it forth. If Joash had shot more arrows, there would have been a greater victory. That's what we see in this story. If he had shot less, it would have been a lesser victory. The concept or idea here is never limit God. What God wants to do, move with him. Don't get in the way of him. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do, what does the Bible say there? Anybody? I know you, you know it because you're reading it. Okay. <laughs> Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, and boy, we can ask and imagine quite a bit, according to his power that is at work within us, not according to our resources, but according to his power which resides in us, Matthew 7, 7 through 8, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and one who seeks finds, 
And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Wow, that's powerful. And I remember the day where we were back going place to place to find a home for Capital Life Church. And we were in a handful of places before, before we ended up coming here to Glebe Road. We started out at 2nd and Pennsylvania Southeast in a prayer center there clustered by the Library of Congress buildings. And it was wonderful to be able to be as close to the Capitol as you can be without being in a federal building. And we could sense the destiny coursing through our veins in that first service when we had 60 people jam-packed in a room that probably fit 45 to 50. No air conditioning. August in D.C. But we felt that we couldn't be more perfectly in the will of God than where we were. And we went to places like Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon had just opened up an auditorium for the very first time. It was brand new. No one had been in it yet. And we got in there for a matter of about two months. And we were right on George Washington's property. And I enjoyed that. I gave so many illustrations about George Washington in my sermon. <laughs> I mean, he was shot. And the holes would be in his, in his uh, outer um, garment or, or coat, but wouldn't penetrate him. People didn't know why he wouldn't die. It's like God was all over George Washington. And we'd share about those stories. And we ended up uh, being at the um, Spectrum Performing Arts Theater across from the old museum. And, uh, and that was an old building uh, that was there that had a wonderful auditorium. But we had no choice in what would be up on stage. And you know the story. The large 30-foot spider that was up there because Synetic Theater was there. And we couldn't change anything. We couldn't cover anything. And the legs went out into the audience. And people said, is this a part of your worship experience? The answer is no. <laughs> no. But and all of that until God brought us here. And when God brought us here, we had been thinking that we were saving as much money as we could to ultimately rent or lease a building and hopefully be safe in it for five to 10 years. But God had bigger plans. And when God brought together two churches and aligned everything to where he would give us as a gift this building and the parsonage next door to be a headquarters of hope right here in the D.C. metro area, all of that was huge thinking way beyond our resources. I challenge you to go beyond your resources. I challenge you to go beyond your life story. You may have a life story that you feel made you to be born on, the, on this certain side of the tracks. Maybe something happened with your growing up years that caused you to feel like you could never dream greatly for God again. But God is all over you. He chose that little shepherd boy to show everybody else what could be done. What a powerful thought with that. And so we see that we're to ask. We're to ask the one who is able. You don't ask just anybody. The reality is sometimes we talk about things with people who aren't able to do anything for us. But when you talk to God, you're talking to the source of all things. God is more than able to give you the answer for what you're asking him and to move upon your life with holy wisdom. Ask, seek, and keep seeking. Don't let go. Don't give up. Keep seeking until you knock on that door until it's open. And when it's open, you'll be one of the ones who experiences God in a way that most people never will because you asked and you sought and you knocked. And if you felt like giving up, if you felt like there are things there that honestly, if I were to share them, you'd understand what I feel like giving up. But God wants you to know he brought you here today because he is filling you with his Holy Spirit, with power and with purpose. And somebody's on the other side of your obedience. So don't give up. We're all on the other side of Jesus's obedience to go to the cross. Had he not done that, had he given up, we wouldn't know what it is to know God intimately in relationship. And we can know that, and you should know that before you leave here today. We'll give you the opportunity to be certain of that. It's important that we do not stop pursuing God's best. Never get lackadaisical in your faith. Never develop a lesser appetite. I see Jacob and Esau there, and Esau comes back, and he's hungry. 
So in being hungry from having done all of the hunting, he ends up wanting to have some of that porridge or pottage or stew, depending on what translation you have. All I know is it's food and he's hungry. You can smell it. You can almost taste it. And he develops a lesser appetite. Here he is, the firstborn. There ought to be a blessing upon that a favored status. But he's willing to release what is his birthright and blessing in order to have what's right before him with that stew. He had developed a lesser appetite for things spiritual. I challenge you, never, ever get soft in this. Never allow yourself to be less than absolutely hungry for God and the things of God, and God will honor that. A definition of success, there's many out there. Here's a thought. Success rises one more time, then failure goes down. So you may feel like, honestly, I've been through so much. Just get up. God will meet you there. Just get up. Don't give up. Don't be down on your knees uh, in, in, in a sense of failure. Be on your knees in prayer till you rise. And in verse 4, the Bible says, shut the door. It's not about the opinions of others. And boy, do we get all those opinions fly, flying at us from all directions. You've got opinions of what you should be and who you should be and what you should wear. And I remember it was a Nike out there with images, everything. You just look a certain way. You got to have this to be successful. Boy, those images are out there right now in all the marketing uh, at Christmas time that if you'll just dress this way, you'll be happy. If you have this car, you'll be really thrilled. And all of those things are constantly a deluge upon us. But the reality is there's a moment where you just have to shut the door and know that you're meeting with God and know that you heard from God and know that God is speaking his wisdom into your life. I can't imagine ending 2019 and launching into 2020 without knowing I've heard from God. It ought to be a tradition for you, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a sense that it becomes tradition, you don't have heart in it, but it ought to be something that you do every year, and I do it every year, that I get to the end of the year, and I thank God for everything he's done that year in my life, and I recognize what he's done, and I praise him for what he's done. I remember going back to that story of Corey Ten Boom and Betsy, and here they are as sisters at the prison uh, camp there at Ravensbrook, and they have to stand there naked before these guards who would leer at them and make comments and all the rest of it. And as that's happening, uh, at that moment, Betsy, the older sister, looks at Corey and says, uh, recognizes within her that she's dejected, rejected, feeling at the lowest place you could possibly imagine, not knowing if family members who, who went to other prison camps are alive or not, not knowing well, whether they will live through this feeling all of this as she stands there naked. And Betsy, recognizing it, said to her, said, Corey, Jesus, he hung naked on the cross for us. And Corey looked back at Betsy and said, and I never stopped to thank him. And when you recognize what Jesus has done for you, when you recognize the price that he paid, that he takes us through all of these things to a point where we know that we have that moment of intimacy with him, that you know what, amidst everything I'm going through, I'm going to shut the door till I know that I know that I know that I've met with him and I'm thankful. And I thank him for all that he's done through this year. And then I listen to his heart because God has a strategy and he's working it out. He's orchestrating all things behind the scenes on your behalf, on behalf of your family, and God will work mightily through you in the days to come. The you and God moments are the moments that change us. Don't be too busy. Don't be too distracted. They are the moments that change us. And my mom used to say that to me. You get alone in a room. You walk out in a field. You do whatever you need to, but don't stop till you know you've met with him. Don't stop till you know. It's a lot of religion out there. I want to put religion to the side. It's all about relationship. Amen? Verse 5, second part of that verse. She, meaning the widow, kept pouring this oil. Uh, she has one jar, but its content, contents are multiplied 
when poured out. Now, immediately, you should see the analogy there. It's the same with our lives, that what God has given to us as we pour it into others, the comfort that he's given with, to us, the Bible says we're therefore to comfort others with that same comfort. So we put it into use. I could right now hold up before you a seed package. Let's say uh, radishes, whatever it might be, as it was the first thing that came to mind today. So radishes, beautiful radishes. Look at them. They're beautiful. And they're really plump and nice, and they're very, very ripe and fresh. Okay, so look, it's a picture. And I want you to know what a good gardener I am, and isn't this great that these are the radishes that I will one day have in my garden. And you might ooh and ah about the beauty of these radishes. The reality is, if I don't tear that package open and plant that seed, all it's ever going to be is a dream. It'll only be an image of something that you think might happen someday. But when you tear that open, and when you put it into the ground so that God can therefore bring it forth with life, and then bring fruit to it, and then bring shade that will bless many, that analogy is right in the Word of God. And so, I encourage you, don't go around thinking, I love to show people my package of seeds, and I love to be able to shake it. Sounds so cool, and I love to have it in my pocket, and I carry it everywhere I go. Instead, take the seed that God has given you and invest it into the ground. Put God, the love that God has given you in your heart, put the time that God, that's probably the most precious thing to most people is your time, and invest it into the kingdom of God and watch what God will do with that. Isaiah 55, 10 speaks of seed to the sower. In other words, it all ultimately comes from God. It is given into our care for a season of time. So it belongs to God. If it originally belongs to God, then I can tell you it'll never run out. God is the one who places that seed into our lives, and that seed is not possible without him. You can thank God for every blessing that he's given to you. This means your seed won't diminish as you sow it. You can't give away love to the point where you don't have love anymore. You cannot forgive to the point where you no longer can forgive. The reality is those are things given to you by God. Just simply invest the way Corey did, Corey Ten Boom in her life story. What you have in your hand is multiplied when you put it into motion. Don't come to the end with oil still in your jar. Keep flowing it into the lives of others until you see what God can do with it. He will bless you over and over again. Um, verse 6, second part of the verse. Then the oil stopped flowing. If she had been able to gather more jars, there would have been more oil. If there had been less jars, there would have been less oil. It is a challenge to keep from becoming lazy spiritually. We are to continue to be hungry again for God. And when we no longer pour into the lives of others, the oil stops flowing. 